My name is Ruben Chen. I'm a partner here at Kubi, and we are very proud to be able to host uh, this technology firm, uh, technology forum on LED lighting, um, and co-sponsor the event with uh, Monty J. And before uh, we get started here, I'd just like to turn the floor over to Sean Wang from Monty J to uh, provide a, a brief introduction on the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben, and uh, thanks, Cody, for sponsoring this uh, event. I hope we will learn a lot today. Uh, my name is Sean Wang, uh, Monty J's General Secretary. Uh, Monty J was founded about 20 some years ago by uh, many Taiwanese uh, entrepreneurs in the valley, uh, including Terry Guo, who is the uh, first come speaker of this space. Uh, he was a small guy back then. <clears throat> so, this is an organization basically try to foster entrepreneurship, investment, and a lot of cooperation across the Pacific. Uh, right now we have about uh, 15 different chapters, in, including in Vancouver, of course it's, it's initially started in Silicon Valley, and then in Los Angeles, DC, Atlanta, uh, Boston, and Taiwan, Hong Kong, and more recently, uh, Lions in Shenzhen, China, and the Sengdu, China. So we have uh, <coughs> been uh, very fortunate to have a lot of strong uh, company, corporate sponsor. And uh, over here, uh, it's not only just try to build up the bridge, and also we focus on uh, growing, growing the younger generations uh, entrepreneurship. So there's a, a younger MJA, is a Monday J Asian American group. They usually have an annual trip to Asia to visit all the company, build up uh, their network, and help them grow in their career opportunity. Um, so this is it. There's a vision and everything else. But <coughs> basically, this is not really, uh, right now, uh, Taiwan or Asian focus. A lot of Silicon Valley focus. And we are uh, happy to have a lot of these uh, strong uh, sponsors, including TSMC, below UMC, and and many others, uh, including some investment firm here. So I thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. This is a great event, and I hope you enjoy that. And uh, see you around, maybe in some other on the day in the future. If you are interested in, <coughs> in our activity, just check out your website. And I would like to introduce uh, Helen. Helen is our administration. Uh, assistant and also our uh, very strong volunteer group and director is uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Leo. She helped to organize this uh, event and also Lynn in trade. Also. Yeah. Well, thank you, Alton. Thank you very much, John. And <coughs> once again, we're very proud to be able to co sponsor the event. Thank you, Jay. So um, just to set the stage for our discussion tonight, I have a few slides that I'd like to share with you guys. Uh, the first one here shows that um, out of worldwide electricity consumption, uh, about 17% um, is attributed to lighting. Um, and by sheer coincidence, uh, nuclear power plants uh, generate approximately 19% of the electrical power in the United States. Um, and lighting accounts in the United States for approximately 19% of the power that's used. So one could say that um, of the 104 commercial nuclear reactors here in the United States, they could be used to basically keep the lights on. Um, now, if one wanted to increase the functional capacity um, of lighting by 20%, which makes sense, you know, given uh, continuing growth of human population, um, just the growth of various industries. Um, you can either build 21 new nuclear reactors, or you could reduce the amount of energy consumption um, used by light by 20%. And this is where LED lighting comes in. So LEDs use at least 75% less energy and last 25 times longer um, and in fact, an LED circuit gets close to 
efficiency, meaning that only 20% of the energy that is being used by the LED is given off as heat, um, as compared to the regular Edison incandescent bulb, um, which is exactly inverse, it's 20% efficient, uh, which means that 80% of the energy is actually lost uh, as heat. Um, it's obviously even more problematic when you consider lighting that's being used in warmer climates um, that leads to then air conditioning have to, having to be used and whatnot. So the Department of Energy estimates that um, with LED adoption, um, by 2030, there will be an annual savings of about $30 billion um, using today's electricity prices. On a more personal level, um, if you were to use a 100-watt uh, uh, light bulb, it would cost you about $88 a year to pay for the electricity to keep that, that light bulb. Um, if you were to change, however, that light bulb to an LED bulb, uh, the cost of electricity uh, is actually only $23 per year, so you're actually uh, saving about $65 just for a single light bulb. Now, of course, the LED, LED bulbs cost more, and we'll be talking about that uh, later on today. Uh, so there are many applications uh, of LEDs, uh, but lighting is actually the fastest growing application of LED technology, and McKinsey uh, predicts by the year 2020 that um, the global market for lighting will consist of 63% LED lighting. So uh, I think it would be right to say that the future is bright for LEDs. <laughs> um, but there are, of course, uh, some challenges before LEDs will be able to be adopted uh, on a mass basis. Um, and uh, this chart here, uh, just or this slide here, just identifies some of the major challenges. And in par particular, one of the um, challenges that we'll be talking about today is the overall user experience, um, being able to maintain or improve on the experience that users have with the ordinary Edison incandescent light bulb. And hopefully, we, we will, those in the industry will be able to learn from uh, the mistakes that occurred with the CFL industry where there hasn't been a, a massive widespread adoption of that technology and that there will be a, a widespread adoption of LED lighting. So, you know, whenever you have a, a high tech um, space um, that is growing, you also need to be cognizant of intellectual property issues. And so what I've included here, hopefully you can see that, is a slide of all the major, uh, or some of the major players in the LED space and the various lawsuits, uh, settlements, uh, cross licenses, licenses, strategic partnerships uh, that are occurring. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of activity here because it is a very promising uh, space. And so you know, my uh, point as a, a patent uh, litigator and counselor um, is that you want to make sure those involved in this space want to make sure that you build a strong patent portfolio um, for at least the following reasons. One, of course, you want to protect your core technology. Two, you want to be able to attract investors uh, to your company. Three, you want to be able to ward off potential competitors in this space, in the specific space within LED that your company is focusing on. Um, four, you want to be able to create some parity if your company happens to be sued uh, by another LED company or just some other company. Um, you want to be able to have the ability to basically sue that other company back to create some parity and possibly get a better settlement or even a cross license uh, out, of the, out of the lawsuit. And then finally, uh, you may want to um, have intellectual property as a potential source of revenue uh, through licensing your patents um, and other intellectual property. So it's now my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Siminovich. He is the director of the California Lighting 
Technology Center at UC Davis, uh, the Rosenfield Chair in Energy Efficiency, and a professor in the Department of Design with the UC Davis College of Letters and Science. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce a true expert in this area. I'm going to turn the floor over. our hosts for inviting me out to speak tonight and all, all of you to come and let's listen uh, to this really interesting event that being sponsored tonight. I think it's uh, an interesting way to spend uh, um, a Thursday night. And so I was asked to talk about how do you choose a, a light source and um, can we do it in 20 minutes? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk more about um, generalities and, and concepts to, tonight. And so the kind of thing you would expect from, a, from, from an academic. Um, but I always start, this is the, the first slide from a, a class I teach on color. I teach uh, one, of the, one of the classes I teach at Davis is on color, color theory. And so you might want to ask, well, why is this professor showing us a, a Buddhist temple? And so I like to think of myself as, as more of a student than a professor. And I'm actually learning a great deal about color theory by working with the, uh, the folks in Thailand, trying to understand color rendering inside these, 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 these complexes. And over the last number of years, I've been spending uh, my summers, which is the, the wrong time to spend in Thailand, um, but I've been spending my summers really <coughs> learning color theory. And so I thought I knew a little bit about color, but I really learned a lot about color theory by spending many hours inside Buddhist temples. And um, I've used a lot of this thinking to inform some of the color standards, um, the voluntary standard that we did two years ago, and the upcoming uh, Title 24 and Title 20 standards are being informed by um, some new thinking on color. And I think a lot of this is, is the kinds of things I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, t tonight. So choosing the right light source. Again, I'm, I'm going to deal with this conceptually and from a fairly abstract kind of, kind of point of view with the idea of giving you some tools and some thoughts to think about when you go and choose a light source for, for your home. And so a little bit of background. Um, we've heard a lot about energy. Um, California is really committed to, to zero energy buildings. 2020 is coming true. When we build our residential buildings, they're going to be zero energy. Um, 2030 commercial buildings and, and, and other non-residential buildings. And we're starting now to really understand you know, what does zero net energy mean? And there's not great agreement on this. Um, but certainly zero net energy means a whole new world for us in terms of energy efficiency. Um, and so while the policy folks work strategically on how to link renewables with energy efficiency, that's a, an argument that um, is going to take some while to, to sort out. But everybody agrees that there really needs to be a very deep commitment to, to energy savings. And so if you look at the vision for California, um, we're, we're certainly going to wrap our arms around zero energy. But it's going to be based on very aggressive energy saving approaches. And we're going to be looking at 50% reductions in, in lighting energy intensity in order to become zero energy. And so this is going to mean really doing things very, very differently. Um, you've probably heard of some of the underlying legislation that's, that's been, been um, brought to bear to help us focus on zero energy. Hoffman Bill is, is one, of, one of them. And the idea of reducing our, our, our energy consumption in residential buildings by 50%. Okay? That's a very aggressive target. And so the things that you're seeing now that are being formulated in Title 20 and Title 24 are really focused on the, the idea that we're going to be saving 50% energy in our, in our homes. And it's a, it's a very ag aggressive target, considering that we've had 44% savings since 2005 in our residential buildings because of, of, of energy efficient lighting. So it's going to be a, a, deep, a deep dive. 
And sort of to, to help sort of look at where, where we're at, this is, if you look at this blue line and you look at time and you look at residential lighting energy use, um, the dotted line is where, where we're at now. And so the, the, the current trajectory, if we do business as usual, which I like to tell the, the, the Energy Commission, we're very, we're very good at business as usual. Um, so what we really need to do is have this very sharp upward trajectory in terms of energy, energy savings, energy efficiency, which means very aggressive uh, uh, behavior. And so the, the, the road to Huffman is really paved with LEDs. And so I like, like to, like to re remind the policy folks that we really need to get quite aggressive about the use of solid state technology if we're really realistic about the Huffman goals and indeed really, a, a really sincere about zero net energy and it's not just a flag wave. Okay? So there's tools that have been put into motion um, to support this. And this is you know, some of the things I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, if you look at a, a typical housing development uh, being built today, um, most of the lighting inside the home is still from, from low efficacy um, heaters, in, incandescent lamps. So it's like, how can this be in California with all this aggressive energy savings? But the reality is, is that we're still, um, we still love incandescent lighting. And so there's a huge potential here and it's about 45% if we were to convert those to high efficacy. And so the idea is that high efficacy lighting could certainly satisfy our Huffman bill and could certainly address our zero energy for residential. In terms of the efficiency side, it's the renewables folks need to do their business, but certainly on the efficiency side, there's a great opportunity. And you know, we've gone through all the different parts of the home that with, and you're all welcome to this data, but there's incandescent light sources are well loved and well enjoyed in California. So Title 24, which re regulates the way we, we build buildings, residential buildings, and non-residential non buildings. In, in residential, there's basically three approaches for this. There's high efficacy luminaires, and this is luminaires that, that have more lumens per watt. Um, sensors, um, and this is typically occupancy vacancy sensors, uh, motion sensors, um, and then dimmers. And this is basically the aggressive savings that we've got up since 2005 is because of those three things. Now, we're looking at a new challenge here of taking this and amending it and saying that all fixtures in the home would be high efficacy if they use a high quality LED lamp. A high quality LED lamp is principally focused on color quality issues. And so the proposals today are moving forward is how do you bring in color quality and consumer quality into the, into the regulatory process? So a little, little bit more background on this. <coughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to introduce some of the color and design metrics that, that um, we're looking at, the kinds of discussions and kind of some of the issues that are, that are um, why we're really focused on this whole quality issue. And just to touch on this real, real quickly, Basically, two, two metrics that, that you look at. Is what, one is color temperature, which re refers to the coolness or warmness of, of a lamp. And, and color rendering index, which is how good do we look when we look in the mirror relative to, to, to color. Okay. And so you all know about the, you know, the dynamic nature of daylight is that when, when the sun is just rising, we have a very low color temperature. And then midday, very high color temperature. We know that there's this very dynamic quality to to, to daylight. And, and we're, we're very tied into this on an evolutionary basis. Um, and so I really look, we really look at what are the kinds of color characteristics that we were, we were born with. So there's a, both a biological evolution and also a cultural evolution relative to the to light, light source. Uh, very high color temperatures th throughout the day. This gets into circadian rhythm. And this is what Sarah was really talking about the idea and the construct of how do we start supporting the concept of circadian design inside our buildings. And so that's, a, that's an upcoming issue. And so it's sort of very pleasant, low, very low color temperature in, in, in the evening. So I, this is sort of first generation lighting design, all puddling around a very low color temperature radiator. And we still do this. So, the television is sort of displaced some of the fireplaces at a very high color temperature <laughs> light source. And that's part of our circadian disruption. So I, I kind of, um, 
to kind of talk a lot about sort of lighting design and the fireplace is kind of something that is a, a strong, strong cultural e evolution. You know, as designers, architects, engineers, we, we try to put numbers to, to lots of these things. And, and um, the whole Kelvin scale was one of our first, first constructs of really describing how cool and how warm is a, is a light source. And so this is actually a way of putting a, a numeric value on this. And when someone says, I would like a cool light source, well, how cool? You know, what a warm light source. Well, how warm? And these seem like sophomore questions, but I can tell you we deal with that day and day, with, with every day with, with architects and, and also with regulatory people in terms of you know, how warm, how cool, and how, how do you describe this? And so color temperature is a very early construct that attempts to put a number on the warmness or coolness of, of, of a light source. And it all relates back to a black body radiator. Take a piece of metal and heat it up and start to blow And so the idea is you can tie a number to that and you can really be quite precise about how cool or how warm something is. Not whether it's good or bad, just it's the coolness or warm warmness. Okay. So very low color temperatures where you're, you're, you're um, very low te temperature flame start putting more oxygen to this, burn at a much higher temperature, it starts blowing blue. Okay? So this the whole idea of warmness and coolness. Nothing to do with, with, with goodness or badness. It's just the relative warmth or, or warmth or coolness of it. And so correlated color temperature, and I tell my students correlated means sort of like. Sort of like. They usually get that, CCT. And you can take a black body radiator and you can match it to a whole variety of different types of light, light sources. And so um, we have fluorescent light sources that are um, surpassing 10,000 Kelvin, look like a very, very blue, blue uh, sky. We're using this in some of our medical care facilities where we want to really replicate a typical type of very cool blue sky. And then candlelight, very, very low color temperature. Very so again, CCT is the, one of the first met metrics that we could use to describe a light source and be very precise about it in terms of its relative warmness or cool coolness. And there's precious little relationship here between goodness or bad badness. Okay? This doesn't mean that one is better than the other. However, there may be a temporal appro appropriateness because certain color temperatures are better during the day than others. We tend to think that higher color temperatures are good during the day lower co color temperatures throughout the night at the lower level. And obviously there's a, there's a good <coughs> circadian evolutionary argument to support that. And so I think that this is where the goodness or badness of the, the light source co comes in. Typically in residential environments, we tend to work with low, lower color temperatures, lower light levels. And again, I would argue strongly that there's a good evolutionary uh, ar argument on this. But there's also cultural variations. Not everywhere in the world do we see a bias towards low color temperatures. And for those who, who travel to Asia, you can tell where the North Americans live by the color temperature of the condominiums. Because all the other condominiums are all at 5,000 or 6,000 Kelvin. But in, in Europe and North America, we, we tend towards the, the, the warm, low color temperatures. Um, and again, I would say that evolution argues for that. Also, biology, we have many more red sensors than we have others. And women have even more red sensors than men. So there's a, both a cultural and a, a gender basis for, 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 for this. So I argue strongly on the cultural association, um, this whole concept of warmth and relaxation, and appealing to the a broad level of, 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 of the, the, the red, red sensors. Higher light levels, higher color temperatures. And go outside in the middle of the day, 6,000, 10,000, 12,000, very high color temperatures. Um, so there's an evolutionary analog there to support this. And we're already starting to see this in circadian design. Um, Berman at Berkeley uh, worked on this back in the 80s where he showed people, people response and, and the whole, the famous SP ratio was born, born there and now we call it the circadian response where pupil size um, and alertness and perceived brightness is tied into color temperature. And so that's been, there's been a lot of science on, on, on this. Um, we're starting to see a shift in towards higher color temperatures throughout the day. We've already seen that in, in, in California where we're, we're, we're shifting a little bit to the higher color temperatures. 
Certainly in the productive environments, laboratories, machine shops, et cetera, people are exploiting the 5,000, 6,000 Kelvin lamps with smaller pupil size and, and better visual acuity. The world doesn't all agree on this. And we get, there are numerous PhDs that will argue on, on this. Okay? That's part of what they do. So the, the move to high color temperatures, 5,000 in work environments, work intense environments, partially supported by pupil size and, and circadian. This gets into mel melanopsin resp response. Um, transitioning on these two metrics away from, from color temperature now into color rendering, which is the, the other tool, the principal tool, I think you can use in the selection of light sources, is this whole idea of, of you know, color temperature is really uh, you know, tied in temporally relative to circadian response. There's some very strong cultural implications. Um, the Tiller at Nebraska has been doing a lot of work on this, and, um, and the, there's not a lot of science to, 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 to support, you know, sort of the, the, the psychological effects of, of, of CCT, but we're, we're seeing, seeing more of it. I think perhaps of all, all of these met metrics, so there's a lot of argumentation on, on correlated color temperature. And I'm going to come back to that. But in terms of the regulatory process, um, it's very much tied into the light source that it's displacing. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Color rendering, I think, is the more important construct. And as I tell my students, it's all about how the candy looks. Candy looks great. You've got a really good design. And it really is about the candy. The candy. <coughs> And it's very hard. We have all these color displays up, up at the center, and it's hard to lug all these things down. But you're welcome to come up and see it. But basically, this is the kind of thing that you see. If you put a challenge light source on one side, your tomatoes don't look good. If you put a great light source with a 90 plus CRI, the tomatoes look pretty good. Okay? And it's and it's pretty pretty straight straight forward on this. And it's it's basically how good does the candy look? And this is color rendering index. Lots of metrics. Um, color quality index. There's um, lots of different folks wor working on this. The only international one now that's w that's sort of well well supported is, is color rendering index. And um, if you use a high color rendering index, pretty much everything else falls into place, even with the other metrics, the gamut, area, or the other different me metrics. Once you get above 90 CRI, pretty much everything falls into it, in, in place. And it, it's basically, historically, they looked at some very dull colors. And they, they got college students, and they looked at these things. And, and college students, you pay them enough money, and they'll sit and they'll look at blank color samples all day, all day long. <laughs> um, we don't, they don't do that anymore. It's all done analytically. You can do this with a computer program and a, and a spectrophotometer where you monitor the spectrum. And you, just, you do this analytically. So basically, it's how good do these colors look um, uh, relative to a standard, relative to a, a, and they're progressively expanding this. The, the international one, the international one is, is eight. They're looking at R9. Um, there's, there's talk now for the next round in the fall semester, to, in the fall quarter, to have um, a very broad number of co colors, because uh, now it's done computational. You don't have to restrict it to you know, how much money do you have and how many college students can you, can you expend. So this is basically looking at color samples and comparing co colors relative to some standard. Okay? And in the past, the standard has been an incandescent and day daylight, depending upon the appropriate color temperature. So it's how good does the candy look when I, when I look at it under this light relative to this theoretical lamp. So the color rendering, again, another fairly precise n n number. Okay. How do these things come together? Um, reaching goals. So we talk a lot about, about Huffman goals and zero energy goals and 50% savings and um, where do we go? And sadly, um, we have some bitter lessons and we have some uphill climbing to do because um, if you go into an environment like this and you ask them for an energy efficient table lamp, they'll look at you for a little bit, try to figure out where you're coming from and they'll say, Come with me. I've got one in the back. You know, or, sorry, we, we don't do that kind of thing. You know, so you'd be hard pressed to find an energy star table lamp or floor lamp in a place like this. And this is where you know we, we buy a lot of our products. 
And so CFLs were, were um, sort of an experiment that we spent a lot of money on. Um, and what we did was we moved the color constructs that we had for office spaces into, into the home. And there was an agreement in the 80s that ADCRI was going to be what we would use on fluorescent. When we were moving from halophosphate to trichromatic phosphors. The agreement was 80 was good because it was a step up from halophosphate in terms of color rendering. And the decision was made, well, we really don't need to explore much further because no one's ever going to use fluorescent in the home anyway. So this was a huge mistake. It was a huge mistake because it really capped phosphor research. We didn't really push above ADCRI, CRI. And then sadly, we moved low color rendering light sources into American homes. People choked. They didn't like, didn't like it. Okay. And so there were three basic issues. And there's lots of, lots of papers written on, written on this. And you can see this for yourself, where you compare a, an ADCRI light source with a 90 plus light source with skin. And we think that's, that hands or skin are a really good me metric. And we suggested that to the CIE committee. They kind of laughed at us a little bit, um, that they like the color samples. But now they're actually looking at you know, how, do we, how do we include these kinds of ideas. So it's basically color rendering, dimming, and optical. These are the sort of the main departures that we saw in compact fluorescent. We all know about the sad stories. And, but the sad part of this is that we spend an enormous amount of money on, on doing this. And we could have transformed this mar marketplace with the kinds of things that we know now. Okay, so this, um, and plus we taught consumers to be very suspicious of, of energy efficiency because unlike energy efficient refrigerators that keep your beer warm and, and the ice is the same, and it's still approximately the same amount of space, an energy efficient light source is usually an adventure into the unknown. And, and so this is, this is, we have some lessons to, to learn here. Um, there's a lot happening on this, but basically the green bars, this is just um, respondents looking at very satisfied or, or, or very dissatisfied. The green bars show very satisfied with the light source. So the blue, the light blue, the orange, and yellow are either satisfied or, or somewhat, somewhat satisfied or very dissatisfied. And I've argued intensely with, with the Energy Star folks, would you ever go back to a restaurant where you were somewhat satisfied? Or, or let's take it one more step. Would you go back to a dentist that you were somewhat satisfied with? And usually, you know, that's, you know, so that's, that's the tricky point. But this is the kind of experience that we've had with light sources that don't dim well, have poor optics, and are challenged on color. And there's an intense argumentation on what, what one was it. It's not just one factor. It's a culmination of, of those, those, those things. So let me go through this. ADCRI is, is accept, acceptable. And I make a strong argument in, the, in, in, in my papers that um, this is really more of a measure of tolerance, human tolerance, that we can tolerate light sources that have high levels of color distortion. Right? And so we're really, the fact that people don't choke on ADCRI in offices is really uh, a, a testament to the, our ability to survive and, 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 and endure. And so we know that, that 100 CRI pre predominates in residential and retail. Uh, mm -hmm. we, and it's by, by default in, 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 in residential because we started off with heaters that happened to have broad spectrum and render color very well. But we're already seeing data in, in retail. People are moving to high color light sources because they, they deem that to be a, um, important. And I, and I do a lot of this kind of work here with, with, with my students. And, you know, I show them these colors and I ask them, you know, what color is this? And they say, well, most of them are green. So that's the extent of intel their graduate architects have today. Okay, they'll all agree that those are mostly green. And those are the folks that are designing our buildings. Okay? Now, the engineers are not much better. Okay? And so I also teach engineering students color, color theory. And they'll say, oh, it's blue and green. Okay? But then I shine different light sources on. They'll all disagree about what's blue. And 10% and of the boys don't know. Um, and 50% of, of the girls really know because 50% of all women are tetrachromats, meaning they have four color sensors, which is a whole other theory, which I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> Incumbent technology in the home is 100, 100 CRI, or close to it. Um, this is a slide from a presentation I did with um, 
my friends at Energy Star. Um, and I said that 90% of bedroom lights use, use high color rendering and full dimming light sources. So the Trojan horse is the bedroom. Let's, let's light this place properly and you'll probably get people to engage and embrace an energy efficiency. So temples, back, why, why temples? These are all lit with energy efficient light sources that have an, had incredibly challenged spectrum. So the CRI on these things are 60, 65, maybe 70. And there are a lot of complaints. Why is the lighting so hmm in these temples? Help, help us, professor. So I teamed up with a number of Thai professors who were working on this. You'll notice a lot of reds, golds, and woods because the architecture here designed under, where it was designed under a full spectrum radiator. Candles, car kerosene, incandescent, all have excellent color rendering. So the years that I was studying this, I figured, well, you know, this is why we're starting to choke in California and why we have less than 10% market saturation on compact for us. And so this is when I sort of started theorizing and saying, we should start using color as the Trojan horse for energy efficiency. I told the ties this business about Trojan horse, they said, what's a Trojan horse? <laughs> so, so I brought my own sort of prejudices with, with so I sent a copy of the of Ulysses to the professor. Oh, okay, you know. But you naturally think, you know, yeah, it's Trojan horse. And they didn't get the. But you can see these really rich environments, hard to capture in a slide. But I guarantee you, when you light them with 60 CRI metal halide or 70 CRI fluorescent, you lose the joy that that, that whoever did this originally had had. So it seems like a really simple idea, but this is what what, what sort of helped me get get this thing going. And it's it's. Tried to smooth this in. This is this is 90 plus CRI residential with the idea that the green peppers look green and the red peppers, everything looks good. And it's the woods that you spend a fortune on actually look good. So this is my Thai temple here in, in Sacramento. This is just a builder home that we're experimenting with high color on. Okay. So the idea is to move move from 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 compact fluorescent to 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 LEDs. But let's do it with best practices with 90 plus CRI light sources, where the woods look good, the food looks good, we look good. And, and 90 turns out to be that number that everything above 90, you get, you're, you're, it's at 95, 95 CRI is, um, is it's indistinguishable from, from 100, 100 um, yeah, under, under sort of comparative tra tra training. And then to 90, there's a very small amount of di 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 distortion and then moving to 80 is four times the color distortion that you would experience from going from 100 to 90. So, so high efficacy and high CRI can li li live together. Okay. So this is, it's been argued that, well, it, it, there's too much of a penalty. The, it's the same device, okay. it's just a different phosphor, and it's how you score a lumen. A lumen is a very ill-constructed um, term to describe color. Okay, it's a, it's a, it, 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 it needs a much better de de definition. And so for Energy Star to use the lumen as lumen equivalent is just not, not correct. It's not technically correct because it does not lumen match an incandescent. It's a different type of lumen. And what we do is we artificially score um, low CRI light sources high because it tends to concentrate the light in the L end of the spectrum. And even my first year students know the math on that. Quality approach. So what's California doing? Is need to be nice to Energy Star. So it's an Energy Star plus approach, with the idea that that we would develop some initial specifications based on the best agreement in science, in the industry. We refine with research, and we would engage in education. So I'm going to jump through this. Um, and it's again based on the three constructs: improved color, 90 and above, dimming. It needs to be dimmed. People like dimming. They don't like the flicker or the humming or the buzzing or the smoking. And longevity, five years plus. And so I've got a whole list of sort of, this is the first step. You know, it's, it's the idea that the CRI is above 90. Fairly tight consistency. None of this is on your, um, on, 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 written on the package today. Only a few bits are written on the package. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit. We talk a lot about, about CCT, big arguments on this. But basically, anything, anything 3,000 and, and under, um, there's a strong interest to only maintain 2,700, but that's not 
How many one time? Twenty five. Twenty minutes. Um, so I do a whole comparison between sort of Energy Star and the California quality metric. The California quality metric is now supporting the rebate, rebate programs in California. And um, it's also, uh, most of it is in Title 24 for dedicated fixtures today. And we're, we're thinking that it will get sort of further adopted into the 2016 stand, standard. The existing joint appendix, which goes into, in fact, this su summer, um, it's called the JAA. I don't know why they call it that. This is not my living room. Um, but it calls for 90 CRI, CCT of 2,700 um, to 4,000. And to qualify for high efficacy, your fixture, fixture must be this. Since I look at this as a starting point, where are we today? Okay. Um, many commercial retail applications are, 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 are really looking at this. The retail folks have got this. And again, I've argued strongly that if a large retailer understands the value of high color quality, why, why would we um, essentially force consumers in homes to, to have ADCRI? Because if you say ADCRI, nature goes to the lowest common denominator. And we'll all go to ADCRI light sources. And I know that because that's where we're at today with all, all the data that, that we've got. Um, I don't own stock in Sylvania. Okay. Um, CRI 95. Okay. So it's possible to have a light source here that is, that is indistinguishable from incandescent in terms of color, color quality. Um, lots of manufacturers are doing this. It's possible, feasible. Um, the, the cost adder is not, not significant. And the, the efficacy argument is fallacious. It's just not right. It's not, there's no loss in efficacy. It's the same device. You know, it's just for scoring it differently. I've asked Energy Star to come and take my color class, but they, up to this point in time, they've refused. I have this little write-up. You can go to our web page, and it goes through sort of the, uh, sort of, you know, I talk a lot about sort of the things to look at when you're actually selecting a specific light source. And I talk about the lumen output, and I talk about the directionality and the, co and the color quality. So you can use this when you get into, get into a specific light source. Today, what I wanted to do is really talk about generalities and, and abstract thoughts to help inform your thinking when you, when you sort of you know, dig into this. And so this is from, from, our, um, from our partners at uh, Pacific Gas and Electric who are very concerned about, about quality and the idea that we start um, incentivizing and moving high quality products into, into the California homes with the idea that they actually em embrace them. And again, there's goodness and bad, there's no goodness or badness here. And this is because color temperature, it depends on what you want and what you're trying to do and what time of day it is. We're trying to bias towards the lower color temperatures for replacement products because that's what you're replacing is a 2700. So typically if people get what they have, they're happy. Okay. Shape of the distribution is, is, is the voluntary metric and the specification that we're pulling together for the quality metric is looking at an isotropic, nice uniform distribution so that it matches an incandescent lamp. Now, is that a good thing? Maybe, maybe, okay. Um, to me, it's un unclear uh, because I think an LED can do many things that an incandescent can never do. So why are we making it round just because when you blow a glass, it turns into a sphere? So it seems kind of naive to why do we keep generating this? And so I'm never gonna win that argument. At least not soon. Um, so the idea is that if you've got an isotopic light source, that's what we should be asking manufacturers to produce so that we'll replace that. And I'm okay with that if you're gonna put public dollars behind this. This one for sure. Um, and the, the, the color ma matching is always, always, we look at color samples. The best things to look at are colors that are saturated three-dimensional and you're familiar with. So the red is a very saturated color in your, the blood. It's three-dimensional and you're familiar with it. So I always ask people, look at your hands side by side on two different illuminants. And that will tell you very quickly how good of a light source it is. Because I'll get people say, I relap my home with ADCRI product and I have no problem with it. And I said, well, I mean, it, it's, it's a, color's a, rel a relative kind of experience. And if you go outside, 
and you light your living room with the same light sources outside, you'll immediately see the difference. And so it, this needs to be done on a relative basis. Um, a great deal to be learned by people that have studied color for, for long periods of time. And so I go back to this every summer and, and I learn from, try to learn from these folks in terms of how they describe color. And, and, um, and again, people who have dealt with color for long periods of time know a great deal. And so I like to think of myself as I, as I tell my students I aspire to be a better student. And, and so I'm looking at this transition of professor to student. I think it's kind of an admirable kind of process for me. Anyway, so I don't know if there are any questions at the end. Yes. Okay. So at this point, I'd like to invite all the panelists up and take some seats. didn't let you know, but there will be a short quiz on color rendering and color temperature <laughs> I always threaten the quiz, but it, it tends to clear the room very quickly. Um, uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to have a panel discussion on LED lighting. Um, so let me introduce um, our speakers for the evening. Um, you obviously already know Dr. Semenovich. Um, we have uh, first to my left, uh, David Thayer. He is a senior product manager at PG&E, uh, specializing in helping PG&E customers choose affordable, energy efficient lighting. Uh, Mr. Thayer has been working in energy efficiency and renewable energy for nearly 10 years, and he has held uh, product-focused roles at companies such as SunPower Corporation and EcoFirst. Um, next to David, we have uh, Dr. Robert Bullman, Bob Bullman. He is the Technical Director of Commercial Lighting uh, for Qualcomm. Uh, Dr. Bullman has over 40 years of uh, technological success um, in various R&D organizations and entrepreneurial uh, ventures. And at Qualcomm, he leads a commercial lighting program for developing high efficiency, thin profile LED lighting products for directional illumination and LCD backlighting. And to Dr. Holman's left, we have uh, David Chen. He is the CEO and co-founder of Jade Sky Technologies, a manufacturer of LED driver chips uh, that enable dimming performance and LED lighting. Uh, Mr. Chen has uh, 20 years of work experience here in Silicon Valley and has held senior management positions at both publicly traded and privately held companies such as Volterra um, and Acros. And so uh, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to come here tonight and speak. Uh, we have our panel of experts here. And let me start by asking uh, David, Robert, and David to describe a little 